This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and is not to be considered medical advice for any particular patient. Clinicians must rely on their own informed clinical judgments when making recommendations for their patients. Patients in need of medical advice should consult their personal health care providers. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of That's Pediatrics. I'm John Williams, Professor of Pediatrics and Chief of the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases here at the UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. And I'm Steph Dewar, Vice Chair of Clinical Affairs and Residency Program Director. And I'm happy that you're back to listen to this episode of That's Pediatrics. Today we have Dr. Paul Subolsh, who's the Chief of Bone Marrow Transplantation and Cellular Therapies at UPMC Children's and specializes in pediatric hematology oncology. Dr. Shubbles also directs National Institutes of Health supported research program focused on developing strategies to help the immune system rebuild itself and reduce patients' risks for viral infections after cord blood transplant. He has been a leader in the development of a new approach to blood transplantation that has enabled many more patients to benefit from this potentially life-saving therapy. Paul, thank you so much for joining us today and coming to share a little bit about your activities here at Children's. So uh, I'm very curious, could you just give us a background of what the, the main efforts that you have going on here? Yeah, thanks, uh, Steph and John, for inviting me. It's an absolute pleasure. So it's been already eight years that I arrived from North Carolina. Time flies. And uh, clearly, um, it was a very exciting opportunity to uh, start the Division of Blood and Marrow Transplant um, here in Pittsburgh with uh, already some history as a program. And uh, now we have really a a divisional uh, effort to um, address many diseases, Um, obviously, um, classic uh, leukemia, lymphoma, um, malignancy uh, uh, type of diseases, and aplastic anemia, but really um, bringing extra breadth uh, and hopefully depth as well uh, to a a vast array of uh, non-malignant diseases. So so really, um, I think, as you alluded, there's a couple of major directives. One is to really um, bring a a suitable graft and transplant option for any child or adult even, um, who could benefit from the procedure. So that really has to overcome certain barriers of uh, um, uh, HLA typing and uh, barriers of uh, uh, lack of uh, perfectly matched donors. And that's where cord blood transplant comes into place. And um, and I consider myself a, a cord blood transplant expert after uh, nearly 20 years of practice. And we really uh, refined, I think, uh, here in the last few years, um, the technology to take full advantage of the rapid availability. And uh, for many diseases that really um, would historically belong to metabolic diseases, neurology, such as leukodystrophies like Krebe disease, metachromatic leukodystrophy, adrenal leukodystrophy, um, and, um, and other diseases, we have a, a, a graph basically for everybody. So just this last uh, seven years since our protocol has been in place, not a single child who came who could benefit, we had to turn away because we were able to find a suitable donor. And they range from, uh, from Haitian uh, Americans to um, children from overseas, uh, from Malaysia, and uh, really um, having the access and uh, ability to overcome the mismatches. Um, uh, we've been able to perform 50 transplants uh, for these otherwise extremely rare diseases, representing nearly uh, 20 different genetic uh, um, uh, varieties. Some are well known, like sickle cell disease thalassemia, and the other ones could be as esoteric as bad lymphocyte syndrome or XLT deficiency, and, and the ones I mentioned. So that's one uh, real uh, strength, I believe, that we, we have here at uh, Children's. And that really um, is uh, paired with uh, a flow of patients from overseas, even, and uh, other sides of the country. Um, We do benefit from close collaboration from my wife's program, the Neurodevelopment for Rare Disorders, that is a major uh, worldwide center for for their assessment and natural history and other therapeutic uh, modality explorations. So 
so that's one area. And then the other area that was really attractive to, to bring me to Pittsburgh is, is, is the uh, possibility to explore further the, the combination of uh, solid organ and bone marrow transplant, whereby bone marrow transplant could uh, hopefully overcome some aspects of uh, rejection and actually uh, lead to some uh, degree of tolerance and uh, freedom from immunosuppression. So we have a, an NIH-supported protocol for lung and bone marrow transplant, and as we are doing it in first in human trial, we are really very carefully focused on select patients who have uh, primary immune deficiencies, um, and uh, they could be up to age 40, and they are mostly ineligible for either bone marrow transplant alone that would have been curative 10 years ago had they been referred to or uh, let's say lung transplant since they are all in lung failure and nobody would uh, consider um, uh, lung transplant for someone whose underlying immune deficiency would destroy the health in your lungs. So painstakingly, um, very slowly and uh, working closely with a lot of help uh, from regulatory and other team members, um, we put together uh, this protocol and, uh, and uh, have met patients really um, from, uh, from a wide variety of uh, states and uh, underlying diseases ranging from chronic granulomatous disease, uh, interleukin-7 deficient, uh, severe combined immune deficiency, STAT3 gain of function, STAT3 loss of function, so some really esoteric uh, immunological diseases um, where, um, again, these uh, unfortunate uh, patients, teenagers, adults, missed the opportunity for a curative bone marrow transplant years ago. So we are in the midst of, uh, of, of, of a revision of the protocol and, uh, and we are excited to um, have ourselves as, as the only referral base in the country. Um, otherwise, I'm really proud to say that um, the division has, has taken off in many, many areas. And this past year, we've uh, started offering CAR T cell therapy um, and uh, we just treated a really complex 20-some-year-old uh, 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 patient uh, who um, had all the classic complications one could imagine with uh, cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity, but uh, um, has received wonderful supportive care. And that's uh, pioneered and led here by Randy Windreich, my colleague. So I think there's a long answer. <laughs> in a few sentences, but there's a lot happening in our division. Paul, it's really intriguing. I think a lot of us grew up in an era where, you know, stem cell transplant was really only done for malignancies, like you mentioned. So I'm really curious. It's interesting that you're doing stem cell, either cord blood or marrow or stem cell transplants for so many other diseases. What percentage of your transplants are for these non-malignant diseases, and are the outcomes different, worse, better? Yeah, a great question, John. I think um, we've, we've actually tipped the balance, uh, probably 60% non-malignant, 40% malignant mm -hmm. transplants. Some of it is related to advances in oncology with new phase one drugs coming where that might be offered to uh, otherwise historically bone marrow transplant eligible leukemia patients, so they go on to those uh, uh, phase one drugs. Um, at the same time, our referral has grown in the non-malignant diseases, and we open new protocols. So our new sickle cell protocol um, that is, again, addressing uh, uh, these teenagers and uh, could be younger uh, patients and even adults who, who would not have a matched sibling, who would not have a matched unrelated bone marrow, but uh, we are focusing with T-cell depleted peripheral blood stem cells to offer six of eight match, therefore two antigen mismatch uh, stem cells, which again would raise the probability of uh, finding a donor up to 90 some percent. So that protocol will, um, will kick in while we've already successfully used cord blood for sickle cell. So I think it's somewhat a, a combination of, of both the growth of the non-malignant referral and again, the wide array of diseases, just immune deficiencies, there's close to 300 genes that's been identified, plus all the other diseases, and also some advances in oncology that uh, might have uh, reduced somewhat uh, the, the oncology patients coming. 
So I would imagine that many of your patients come from local or regional referrals because they're aware of what happens here in Pittsburgh. But you mentioned people coming from, it sounds like, around the world. How do people know of the services that are available here in Pittsburgh? Yeah, so I think um, the, uh, the classic oncology referrals are, are regional, Western Pennsylvania, um, parts of... Uh, um, West Virginia and maybe Ohio. Um, the the rare disease is really um, when you have 30, 40 patients, uh, babies born a year in the country, um, obviously, um, such as like Krebe disease or some uh, types of uh, other leukodystrophies, then um, they tend to gravitate to two, two or three major centers that have established track record and uh, innovative therapy. So, our cord blood transplant, for instance, has uh, the best outcome anywhere in the world, as far as we can tell. Um, so that is a positive uh, um, draw, obviously. We have 95% survival at one year, at which point usually most transplant-related complications would have already taken their toll. So, so in that sense, uh, our transplant-related mortality, um, 5% or so, is, is, um, is probably unsurpassed. And um, in, in oncology, we are striving for similar outcomes. It's a little bit more complicated there as you are pushing the intensity of uh, conditioning to try to eradicate leukemia. So, Paul, you mentioned you've been doing this for a long time, both clinically and your own research. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your own areas of research and how that ties into what you do as the division chief. Yeah, John. So. Um, Back uh, when I was at Duke, um, cord blood transplantation in '98, when I arrived there, was uh, was already established as a, as a viable alternative for those who don't have an HLA matched uh, donor. But as an alternative, it didn't mean that they had the equivalent outcome, and it was clearly um, um, apparent that um, some of it is related to the fact that the lymphocytes in the graft are completely. Um, antigen experienced and to some degree also quote-unquote immature, which might be actually biased uh, away from certain um, so-called TH1, TC1 type of phenotype. So, so it was a, a, an opportunity for me to uh, study in the laboratory since I had a, a, a laboratory interest uh, and presence before um, based on dendritic cell uh, uh, hematopoiesis that I conducted at the Rockefeller University. To, to shift and, and look at uh, really immune reconstitution in the cord blood setting and uh, identify um, opportunities and try to better characterize. So, so uh, over the years, um, I really um, uh, came to understand that even though it's, it's, uh, it's a different graft, it's not immature, it's just a different graft, it takes time to, to um, attain uh, uh, antiviral and, and uh, protective immunity from cord blood uh, cells, but um, actually in, in the inflammatory milieu of a patient that uh, can be attained in a few weeks. So I think that helped a lot to design subsequently the clinical trials because immune reconstitution is such a key um, uh, parameter of, of what we look at uh, post-transplant. Uh, and uh, that led to the various uh, cell therapy interventions, uh, immune boosts that we even can create from the original graft, uh, just uh, saving and refreezing a tiny fraction, to, to the more advanced uh, uh, viral-specific T-cell generations with uh, um, uh, viral peptide stimulation and so on. So that's clearly one um, area. And then Similarly, uh, uh, impediment and barrier for transplant has been graft-versus-host disease, alloreactivity, um, which is rejection from the organ transplant perspective. So my lab has always had an interest, and uh, 10 years ago we, we, we had an interesting uh, um, technology developed that just didn't take off for alloreactive T-cell depletion. And then when uh, I got into the organ transplant, uh, bone marrow transplant world, realize that our organ transplant colleagues talk always about tolerance, which is basically the flip side of alloreactivity. So my laboratory has a probably now a more active um, um, arm working on understanding how tolerance is actually attainable um, 
and and why are we so fortunate in the bone marrow transplant world as opposed to our organ transplant colleagues? So again, with the cord blood transplant, we have so many mismatches, and why is it that we can taper off immunosuppression? So my laboratory is trying to understand um, the the mechanisms for for this, uh, and then apply it to the organ bone marrow uh, uh, strategies. So Paul, what got you into this? avenue, this aspect of medicine? How did you enter into your interest in hmo mm, hematology, question. oncology, and then transplant? Be, if, <laughs> hopefully I won't be hurtful to others, but you always, <laughs> when you choose between uh, opportunities, you have to say no to some and uh, go one. So, so I was always intrigued about the beauty of immunology. And as a resident uh, way back in um, the late 80s, um, um, it sounded like that uh, allergy immunology um, had a uh, sort of a, a, a more uh, chronic disease uh, type of approach, whether it's atopic diseases or uh, asthma or some other ones. And bone marrow transplant was emerging as a as a really exciting uh, um, uh, world where where clearly immunology was uh, underpinning for uh, allogenic transplant. So just like I like more intensive care rotations than general pediatrics, uh, you know, uh, clinic, somehow I gravitated towards that. And I went into Hemong knowing that I would like to do bone marrow transplant. So you like complex and sick patients. So that's, that's a population <laughs> that you, uh, clearly you've chosen well. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, what do you think are some of the most exciting changes that you've seen over the last 20 years of doing this? Um, well, clearly... Um, Outcomes have improved. Uh, supportive care uh, is greatly responsible, and and uh, our collaborator colleagues like you, John, uh, helping overcome fungal diseases and and many of the viral diseases just by pharmacological means uh, has been tremendous. Uh, clearly, um, you know, I, I still entered the field when uh, when uh, cytomegalovirus was. Uh, maybe the major killer of transplant patients. They didn't live long enough to die of GVH. They died of CMV pneumonitis. So day 28, they had um, just an exploratory bronchial lavage to see if there's DP65 in the cytospins or not. So so a lot, uh, we were just very fortunate, I think, in general, that, again, uh, supportive care has improved and, um, and technology um, in general. So also cell therapy, as we can manipulate now the graft um, separate the stem cell component from the various uh, effector uh, lymphocytes, uh, determine the dose and timing of the infusion. Uh, I think this has uh, been a great uh, progress uh, for the field. And the uh, last few years, truly um, moving into haploidentical transplant, uh, um, whereby really everybody has a donor, worst case scenario, it's an uncle, uh, a son, uh, a sister. So, so that's for adults, I think, hugely important. For us child, uh, pediatricians, cord blood could be the answer for everything until age 15. And then once they get to that age and get a little bit bigger and the cord blood cell dose is limited, that's when you need to look for haplotransplant. So I think really uh, cellular engineering, um, uh, the haplotransplantation and supportive care um, and the laboratory techniques, they all combine together to, to improve the outcomes. Well, Paul, we're so glad that you came by and chatted with us today. It's very interesting and exciting to know what's happening here in Pittsburgh, and we're glad that you made the move to come here. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for being here, Paul. Thank you for the invitation. It's my pleasure. Please join us next time for our podcast, and certainly um, subscribe so you hear new content and send us messages for other topics that you'd be interested in. Thanks for joining us on That's Pediatrics.